Welcome to my review of the 2018 through 2020 Star Wars show Resistance. So I'm going to start by telling you this was a show that I liked fine at the time. Fine at the time came close to loving. And it's not because I wanted it to be something that it was never meant to be. The criticisms I have of the show are not based on it not being made for me personally. I realize that it's made to appeal to kids. And this video will have some jokes and I will get into some serious topics. I realize this video is long. I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. And I am not going to be spoiling anything about the show itself. In this video, I, I have done videos where I talk about spoilers on the the seasons. The link will be in the description box. But I will be spoiling everything Star Wars that came out before this show first aired. For, yeah, before the first episode of this aired originally. Now, I have watched every single episode once through and I just got done with the uh, what's it called the the finale right before you know yeah I got done with the finale then I recorded my video talking about the second season and now I'm I'm doing this so it's all fresh in the finale is fresh in my mind yes now the plot so this is set on the spaceport slash pilot hangout slash right racing circuit slash living area the colossus it's a large platform supporting dozens maybe even a hundred people suspended over water and the show follows kazuda siono or kaz for short a new republic pilot who is recruited by the resistance to spy on the growing threat of the first order shortly before and during the events of the sequel trilogy and yes, so let's get into the writing. The they do a decent job of keeping the episode setups fairly distinct from each other. <clears throat> I wouldn't say that any two episodes like just blend in, blend blend together in your mind. And, uh, yeah, the handling of plot twists is okay, but a lot of the time, like, I realize that, that a number of children won't see stuff coming, but there's, you know, to some extent, it's nice if you can watch this, if, you know, and you're no longer a child, and, you know, if, yeah, if you're not a child, some of the, some of the plot twists you're absolutely going to see coming now the pilot episode is good it's not amazing it it does a good job of setting up the the status quo and get you know you get a sense of the colossus of the major characters on it and yeah you know you you get a sense of how kaz is around other people you know, because there is this sort of fish out of water thing, you know, he, in addition to, to, you know, having to pretend to be someone he's not, he is, you know, yeah, he's, he's used to the, the, the Republic military kind of thing, which makes you wonder why he's so clumsy if he's doing well in that, but anyway, you know, yeah. It's, he's, he is very different, and, yeah, I have more to say about that, but it's later in this, it will be later in this video. The, the, um, both season finales are good, uh, you know, and, and honestly, the, the one for season two is almost, like, really really good I will definitely say it is one of those shows I'm not sure they knew that they were only gonna get two seasons I, I 
I kind of get the sense that they would have liked at least one more season, and yeah, you know, it doesn't, it, it works as a, bo both finales work as finishing off the season, but not the entire show, and it's too bad because this really is the first time, you know, th this is not a problem with the Clone Wars, which was, you know, that was like cancelled and then brought back twice. And Rebels, which it's very, very clear from the end of Rebels that they knew that this would be the last. Now, that brings us to the direction. So, yeah, um, some more stuff about the, the pilot. So, the Clone Wars and Rebels, which also, you know, had longer runs and did grow over them. This did not have that, and I do think it is important when you judge this show to keep in mind, you know, it's really only fair to compare this show, which only had two seasons, to the first two seasons of Clone Wars and Rebels, and there was some very goofy stuff in the first season of both of those shows, so... But anyway, um... Yeah, where the Clone Wars and Rebels have mature topics, but are also made in a way that children can watch, you know, Clone Wars especially had faith in kids' ability to handle maturity and not constantly need something childish. In my review of Rebels, I talked about how with Rebels, you know, especially early on, you do have this sense of, like, some of the people behind the show felt that every so often, you know, it's it's a kid's show, jingle some keys in their in their face to, to make sure that they don't get bored kind of thing. This has something similar, but I would say there's often less variety to it. Like, in, in Rebels, you know, I find, I maybe found it a little annoying that they would do the, the jingling keys, but at least they tended to, like, tap different wells for it. We're here, like, so frequently, it's just, we're laughing at Kaz. And just, yeah, I, I don't think it worked as well. Anyway, yeah, um, this one, not so much. It also feels very teen-oriented, like high school kind of thing. CW, The Network, not Clone Wars. And, yeah, Kaz going to this pilot hangout feels like the first day of high school. He's meeting all these new people. Some are friendly to him. Some want to pick on him. The, the authority figures stand in for teachers. They don't have a lot of patience for him. He has to learn not everyone who's friendly is a good friend, especially if they're irresponsible troublemakers. And I really don't personally think it was necessary for them to make so many characters who don't like Kaz at first. Like, Niku, BB-8, and Poe are some of the only ones that actually like him from from the start. You know, in a franchise that has always been about diversity being our strength, community being much more effective than individuals, or a group that just takes orders from above, you know, he's learning power dynamics, he wants to make a good first impression, but accidentally messes that up. He's trying to not tick off any of these people that he's going to be spending a lot of time with, but does accidentally cross some lines because he doesn't know the rules yet. You know, there's a, there's a bar fight, I forget if it's the pilot, but it's very early on, and, you know, in some ways it does resemble a classic bar fight, Star Wars is a weird western, the subgenre, it really felt like a food fight, like, you know, some of it just has people, like, randomly throwing stuff at each other, that's, that's a food fight, that's not a bar fight. Now... Yeah, a lot of the jokes are very predictable, and some of them just go on for way too long. And, right, in some ways it's like Kaz has gone to boarding school. Everyone else there knows each other already. He can't easily go home. And they get a lot out of the fact that Kaz is a pilot, not a mechanic, similar to how when you go from one grade of school to another, it's like all the things you learned are now irrelevant. You have to learn all new stuff. There are a lot of ships and engine troubles on the show. Not a lot a se set up for the sequel trilogy. Some episodes will end with a brief hint of something, but it doesn't make up a lot of individual episodes, especially in the first season. And... Let's see. Yeah, and... and um, 
yeah, some some part into the first season, and we do get some plot that's relevant to the sequel trilogy, other than just brief glimpses right before episodes end. And even then, it focuses on The Force Awakens, despite the fact that that movie, its sequel and two spin-offs, had come out before this, you know, yeah, by the time this episode first aired. And, you know, some of it is hinting at Starkiller Base, something the audience had seen destroyed three years before the episode aired. In my opinion, there is no good reason for so much of the season not delivering anything relevant to the plot of the sequel trilogy. The Clone Wars is about, well, the Clone Wars from the very first episode, whether you're counting the movie or the first episode of the show itself. The very first of the episode of Rebels is about rebel activity during the original trilogy. If they did not have enough ideas for an entire season, at least spread out the plot-relevant stuff better. And I would definitely say there is enough plot to tell during the sequel trilogy or in the lead-up to it that the two seasons of the show could focus entirely on that. And, you know, I, when, I, when I started watching the show, I was really hoping that it would provide more context. And as far as, like, making some of the broad conflicts more personal... It does succeed in that, but it really, I really didn't feel like it did enough to, like, one of the obvious things is, if you have a new republic, how were the First Order able to rise? Why is the new republic and the resistance separate? You know, these are things that are very important to get, you know, when, when you watch the original trilogy, you know, if, if you don't watch the prequels, and, you know, originally there was only the original trilogy, it's just clear that, you know, yeah, in, in A New Hope there is the line, the Emperor, I forget if it has dissolved or will, I, th I think it's, the Emperor has dissolved the Senate. You know, that, okay, there you go. There was a government, you know, fascists did what fascists do, and got rid of the, the democracy, aspect of the government and you know now you just have this small group of regular more or less regular people making up a resistance movement but by the end of the original trilogy the you know the empire was gone so you know yeah the the new republic forms and you know, because we don't, the, the, the sequel trilogy of movies specifically undid the other stories that had been set after the original trilogy. So they're basically starting over, and they don't give a lot of context for how the First Order is so powerful so suddenly, you know, and it would have been, it would have made so much sense for the show to go in and, you know, do that, but... I'm not harsh on the show just because it doesn't do that. And... Yeah, where the Clone Wars, and to a lesser extent Rebels, went to places that television made for children, you know, often doesn't, this show seems entirely determined to avoid that part of it. It reminds me of shows from the 90s or even 80s. Uh, you know, nowhere near as complex as, as filmed stories can get today, a lot of the, the way. You know, I, I will say, if you if you watch the first season and you're like, it was okay, you know, the second season might be more your thing, you know. And, yeah, I appreciate not all former Imperials were with the First Order. Some of them just changed careers. One of them is an excellent racer on the Colossus, one of the Aces. Another is a pirate. And... Characters' personal ships look distinct enough with colors and designs that you can easily tell them apart, even when they're moving very fast, which is, of course, important for racing. Now, there's this ongoing joke that the ship Kaz can use to fly spy mission is the Fireball, a ship in so bad shape that it's likely to explode if you take it out. Considering Kaz is working for Poe Dameron, it just makes you wonder why the Resistance didn't make sure that Kaz would have something significantly better, considering that he's apparently important to them, you know, that, like, any person you tell that you're a member of a resistance movement while there are fascists, you know, you're risking the entire, you know, resistance movement every time you, t you bring a new person into it. 
so they trust him enough for that but then they don't make sure that he has a ship and and the person that Kaz is like working for on the Colossus knows that Kaz is a spy and he has at least one other ship and yet Kaz is you know going in the fireballs it just it feels like false tension like I mean okay I guess if you're not gonna have the protagonist actually be fighting against someone else I guess his ship could be the the danger the source of you know the threat And, yeah, other than maybe, haven't watched them, can't say, the show Droids and the various Ewok projects, every single Star Wars movie and show, up to and including this one, is in some way about found family. A group of people who are incredibly different from each other in many ways, but united by something. But this is the first of them where the found family is not primarily fighting in any Star War. Except for Solo, where at least they are doing something else very interesting. You know... Part of the reason we watch Star Wars is to see people fighting in a Star War. Maybe they were worried that it would feel like they were just doing Rebels again, which already did feel a lot like A New Hope when you're looking at character dynamics and such. So they were looking for some way to reinvent Star Wars, but this ain't it, Chief. And just like Rebels, some of the best stuff is exploring creepy abandoned areas, but there's way too little of it here. And I do appreciate the show actually trusts the audience, can hear someone make excuses for the First Order, find them appealing, without thinking that the average audience member is going to think that that means fascism is good. Rather, it proves that fascism can have appeal to some people, so that's something we need to take into account when fighting it, which we all should. And it does sometimes explore mature and important topics, such as empathy for refugees, typical fascist tactics, green energy versus fossil fuels, trust uneasy alliances and the right according to mdb trivia the two characters orca and flix are the first official gay couple on screen in the star wars universe which just you know right and an mdb parents guide two male characters who work in one of the shops have been confirmed to be gay by the producers great i love it and they're great together they they bicker like an old married couple it's very clear they do love each other and the show never paints that as a bad thing on the contrary and it is this thing of you know they they have some significant differences but yeah and more from the imdb parents guide they don't really make mention of it though in the series and isn't something kids would pick up on what a relief! It truly would be terrible if children realized there's nothing wrong with being gay. A lot of gay people knew, even as kids, that they were gay, and the ones that have supportive parents, family, friends, a support network of some kind, were much happier than the ones that weren't. And the ones that weren't, they didn't stop being gay, they were just miserable. Now, let's see... Right, and some, the, let's see, yeah, a, a few quotes from a Screen Rant article about the show being cancelled. The, the first season is set during the same time frame as The Force Awakens. Season 2 is happening simultaneously to the events of Last Jedi. Season 2 will also lead into the events of Sky, Rise of Skywalker. This is from a story standpoint, why it makes sense for Resistance will end with Season 2. There is nowhere left for the story to go after Rise of Skywalker. The Resistance becomes irrelevant after Rise of Skywalker, essentially making a, yeah, season three equally irrelevant. Of course, there's also the show's popularity to consider when explaining why it's being canceled after just two seasons. And yeah, it, unlike Clone Wars and Rebels, this is, Resistance is not a big hit with adult Star Wars fans. By its very nature, Resistance is aimed at a younger audience and doesn't delve too deeply into the moral dilemmas or Star Wars lore as the previous animated series, that's just fine for keeping Star Wars in the public eye between films and selling toys, not so much for cultivating a devoted fan base, and the ratings show that. And, right, so some quotes from reviews. From the beginning, Resistance sets itself apart from Clone Wars and Rebels. And, let's see. Yeah, um, it has all the hallmarks of a potentially rich show, what we may get is a 
Star Wars RPG racing game masquerading as a TV show with vague, shifting one-note personalities based solely, solely on plot needs. Resistance feels a bit like the Star Wars Galaxy version of Waterworld, and I don't mean that as an insult. People forget the original was pretty good. And... right, it Resistance paints with a much brighter, more colorful palette, but at least initially settles for more palette characters and situations, the kind that don't immediately suggest this is the animated show you're looking for. Without needing to connect to the Star Wars saga in an immensely profound or meaningful way, Resistance can just focus on telling a fun, entertaining story of hotshot pilots and the starships they fly. And let's see... Um... Hmm. One one person said the the art style isn't that good. It feels a bit lazy that they went with such a simple form of animation. I think it works. And let's see. now I understand this is a kids show, but look at Rebels. That was aimed towards kids, but it still provided entertainment for older audiences. Even made me laugh a few times. I suggest you just watch Clone Wars and Rebels instead. And yeah, so this person says the the first season has a so-so opening two thirds and a decent final third. Resistance plays its safest of the recent Star Wars animated shows. It's more child friendly than Rebels, which was itself friendlier than Clone Wars. A lot of the episodes are too lightweight and forgettable. Doesn't help that the majority of the show takes place on and around the Colossus. You don't get a lot of space scenes or other locales. Sure, the first season of Rebels had mostly been limited to one planet, but it, it at least allowed variety. Colossus is surrounded by water. All you have is the station. On the plus side, Colossus is a fully realized, well-designed area. It has many occupants that get fleshed out. That's how the show gets stronger in the end. Characters, motivations, and arcs are set up. You get more invested in them as things go on. As the First Order become more prominent, the threat, threat gets more interesting. And the show does a good job of showing how the Order managed to rise in the outer, outskirts of the galaxy, how the Republic got complacent after the fall of the Empire, the risks of forgetting the sins of the past. And... Yeah, the, the main villains are pretty basic, interchangeable, and uninteresting. And, yeah, um, Kaz is an interesting counterpart to Star Wars Rebels lead Ezra Bridger. Whereas Ezra was a kid who lost a lot and had a reason to fight the Empire, Kaz is a guy who was born into wealth, but legitimately wants to prove himself and do good just for the sake of it. And it is important to make clear that people with privilege can help good causes, Though it borders on poverty tourism, and the show also has Tora, who's rich and has expensive toys, share access to them with her poor friends. Obviously, that by itself won't solve the problems of capitalism, but it is important that the powerful empathize with the poor, and Tora very much does act like, you know, what, whatever. You know, I'm a, a teenager, you guys are teenagers, let's hang out together kind of thing, you know. And that is, you know, yeah. Basically, like, she wouldn't treat them any, she doesn't treat them any different than if they legit were. You know, she lives in a much nicer part of the Colossus, and, yeah, she'll just say, you know, come on, come on over, you know, we'll, we'll play some video games. You can pet my dog, you know, stuff. Now, right, and, yeah, this, this reviewer goes on to say, Kaz takes up way more screen time than he can carry. One reason, reason Rebels worked was because it had an ensemble with a well-established cast. Here, some characters seem to be given short shrift. Of the rest of the cast, I rather like the naive, good-natured Niku. He was a nice change of pace from a lot of Star Wars characters, cynical or war-weary. I got used to the character animation, which uses cel-shaded computer graphics, but it still isn't my favorite. The lack of visible lines on the characters got to me. They seemed like they were in a photo that was ruined by too much light. I will say, I don't think there needed to be as much 
light as, you know, like Star Wars has always been appealing to young audience, you know, um, George Lucas famously said he made the movies for 12 year olds, you know, but I, I don't think it's quite appropriate for Star Wars to be quite that like at the end of the day it is about war you know it makes sense for there to be a bit more more darkness and you know if you look at the original trilogy like there was a a lot of of dark gritty kind of stuff you know but not like not always as dark subject matter as uh, you know but uh, let's see, the scenery is a different story. Set animation is nice, but it, it is the sky and space backgrounds that really pop. Yes, the sky over the Colossus is one of the nicest looking skies I've ever seen. And let's see. Rebels started off weak in its first season, but really grew after that. I'm hoping the same with the Resistance. We'll be looking forward to. Yeah, this is a review of the first season. We'll be looking forward to the next season. And yeah, a different river said mostly a bunch of stupid standalone adventures that don't really progress the plot or develop the characters. And that's yeah, like I I, I can live with the you know, I've I've said my piece about the lack of plot development of the but but the fact that there's also not that much character development just really feels like completely wasted it's just really wasted potential you know and and again really stands in contrast like even when even early season stuff for for clone wars and rebels you know yeah there was a lot of goofy stuff but there was some character development and you had interesting pairings of, you know, characters that were somewhat different. And here is just not much of that. And <clears throat> for a show titled Star Wars Resistance, it does not really give any larger context to the Resistance and the sequel era the way Rebels did for the Rebellion, the originals, or the Clone Wars did for the Republic and the prequels. It feels weirdly separate. A lot of the show technically doesn't even have the resistance in it. It feels more like Lego Star Wars The Freemaker Adventures than Rebels. I, I'm not very familiar with, you know, the only Lego Star Wars I know is the, 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 um, that game that has the entirety of the first two of the trilogies, uh, but yeah, I mean, there is, you know, Lego Star Wars is very, very light and, and kid-friendly, and yeah, in some ways, this is like that. The overall story really lacks the magic, the lore, and mystery that real Star Wars movies and series had on it, the moments that could shiver your body and make you think for hours. It lacked the human humanity on the characters and the construction of the real hero's journey on the plot. Right, I... I would say that this is, this could, like Rebels, this could be the first Star Wars property you take in. And that's definitely, you know, Rebels did a better job of making the world interesting and, and like, giving you a, yeah, give, giving you a sense of, you know, that's also, I mean, the thing is, fascism at least the star wars uh, you know take on it you get the sense very quickly you know whether you're watching a new hope and you're seeing stormtroopers go door to door to arrest someone or you're watching early rebels and you're seeing how they're harassing regular citizens and you know like you very quickly get a sense of that but if you're trying to show something that you know, sort of happens before that because the show starts before the 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 Force Awakens, which is when the that's when they really start to be you know impactful in the which maybe also just wasn't I don't know if maybe they should have just said it like I could I could see a version of this show that started right after the the 
you know, the destruction of Hosnian Prime in The Force Awakens, you know, that still, like, set on the Colossus, but, like, the fact that they have to slowly build towards it, you know, yeah, but, but, yeah, that is, like, they, you know, I can, I can see how there might have been someone making this show who was like, we can't shove fascism in the faces of children, we have to build to it, you know, but, yeah, I, I wish that it had been more similar to, to Rebels, but again, then you have the thing of, why did they just make the same show twice in a row, you know, because there's a lot of differences between Clone Wars and Rebels, you know, uh, yeah, basically the differences between the two trilogies, those two trilogies, and the thing is, this is based on the sequel trilogy, which is very similar to the original trilogy in some key ways, and they had just done four seasons of an original trilogy show, so, yeah. And... Let's see... Yeah. Uh, boring and unimaginative, sometimes poorly written, and some people say it's a show for kids. It doesn't have. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it shows meant for kids can have good stuff. The whole family can enjoy. Uh, okay, and we're back. So, let's see, yeah, some, you know, some say that the animation is very anime style, you know, and, and yeah, it's, it's using cell shading. Honestly, I would say of the, of these three animated Star Wars shows, you know, yeah, I, I would say this is my favorite of these styles then Rebels, and finally Clone Wars. Anime just really works well for Star Wars. Let's see... And... Yeah, one person points out, you know, each time one of these shows comes out, you know, people are are saying it's not good enough the same thing happened with clone wars and rebels and let's see you know i i do agree that i i wish that it overall was better but i could see how it could have gotten better with more seasons and he points out, it's refreshing to get a Star Wars story that doesn't center around a Jedi, the Force, a bounty hunter, or any of that. We finally get a Star Wars show that details the average galactic citizens' lives and their livelihoods. And I would say it was possible to do that and also have, you know, you could, you could have like, oh, you know, I'm just trying to make a living, but then the First Order are coming in and doing, you know, Stuff like that does eventually happen, but I think it took too long to get there. I th I think they could have done it from the very start. And let's see the um the whole point is that a group of people don't have to be officially affiliated with the resistance to be to yeah to aid them and. Right, this is, I don't think the show deserves a 4.8. I think it belongs in the 6.57 range. Yeah, it's 4.8. Wow. Let's see. I genuinely feel most of the ratings and reviews are by people who just saw the trailer and said, nope, that's not Star Wars, or people who saw the pilot or a couple of episodes said the same thing. I agree it's not a masterpiece, but it is very much Star Wars. It is an attempt at doing a larger world building in the Star Wars universe without depending and obsessing over the Skywalkers and romanticizing over the Jedi's being heroes. Let's see... Right, one person says, the mentor is just garbage. The mentor character... Um, yeah, 
Yarek, I think is how they pronounce it, is an old soldier kind of guy. Uh, let's see. You can tell he's sick of war, he doesn't want to get involved in what's going on leading up to The Force Awakens. However, he does not even begin to help Kaz with learning other than a why are you bad at this mentality. And like Kaz, he could grow. Kanan was not a good mentor at first, but pretty early on he was admitting it to himself and wanting to improve. And let's see. Supporting cast is meh. Niku is over the top in his I don't understand something non literal and thus easily duped mentality. Tam is just grumpy. Zeb was surly, but you can see there's more underneath. Bucket is just a cheap knockoff of Chopper. Chopper was rude and funny. Bucket is just, well, he's over a century old. I guess there's respect there. I don't think so. Yeah, I... Like, I Chopper is not my favorite character, but, like, with Bucket, yeah, I it really felt like they just... Maybe someone working on this was, like, really, really surprised that, Bu that Chopper was popular, which... Like, it's easy to see why kids would absolutely love Chopper. And they were like, I, I don't know, I guess just do that again kind of thing. Which, you know, there's a, a lot of Star Wars will have similar ideas and characters more than once. But they'll usually change something significant. And, yeah. Let's see... And yeah, he he does like Flix and Orca. Uh, he says they're my favorite characters so far. They're funny and act like people I've met before. Those uh, those two are characters people can relate to. Yes. And let's see the. Um, yeah, uh, one person points out too few locations, and yeah, there's almost no variety. It's mostly just different parts of the Colossus. They're not distinct enough from each other. Honestly, I think they should have pulled like a Snowpiercer thing with a lot of variety, even though it's just one location, because there's a lot of different class representation. You know, they they simply don't... I, I haven't watched that movie, but I've seen clips, and it's like, okay, wow, there's a lot of difference here. And here, it's just like... You know, let's let's go. There's a there's a bar. There's a living area. There's like mechanic garage kind of place, and there's this. You know, and on the surface, uh, if you're outside, there's like you can buy food and and stuff like that. And that's there's not enough variety between. You know, even when you do get into like there's there's this. What's it called? Um, I think they call it the tower, uh, and and it's basically where you know some of the upper class, maybe I guess probably all of the upper class people live, and it's just like it's it's sleeker, it's better taken care of. There are security, you know, systems in place. That's basically it. Like it doesn't look that distinct from the the poor, you know, yeah. And let's see, one says, not enough happens. Feels like a drama set in Star Wars more than a Star Wars story. Too little depth in animation and characterization. And <laughs> great if you like to watch people run errands. Yeah, that's that's a really good way to put it. This is a commercial in the vein of 1980s toy programs aimed at kids, but for the Star Wars fandom. I'm not buying into it. Shame on you, Disney. Cheap, easy, thoughtless. This is the exact type of garbage that Disney produces now. It isn't Star Wars. There isn't any fun, but there are clumsy hijinks. There isn't any adventure, but there's always somebody promising one. And that's also really good. Yeah. There's definitely much less action than Clone Wars and Rebels. And, you know, tension on the show doesn't always arise from more rebel activity. A lot of the time, it's just interpersonal conflict with others who usually just want to beat Kaz up, not kill him, so we're back to the, the high school metaphor or boarding school kind of thing. That brings us to the characters. 
So yes, this is the first animator live action show in Star Wars in decades to not have a major character who's a Jedi or at the very least get their hands on a lightsaber early in their story. Hence the ticker tape parade celebrating that interesting change. Christopher Sean plays Kasuda Kaz Ziono, a young pilot for a new republic who becomes a resistance spy on board the Colossus. He has a difficult relationship with his father, which started when it became clear to his father that Kaz intended to become a Star Wars protagonist. And basically the one place that he is in his element is when he's flying everything else he has to learn, and his slow progress can be frustrating. One reader says he's as clumsy as Jar Jar, and there's definitely a lot of slapstick with him. At least he isn't a racist caricature like Jar Jar. Honestly, I see Kaz more as a C-3PO if he were a pilot rather than programmed for etiquette. Sometimes he talks a really big game. He will anger people that he shouldn't, often on accident, not understanding why. When he's out of his element, he will try, but he won't necessarily get things quite right. And I want to make it clear... You know, I do love a lot of slapstick, including most of the stuff in A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. One of my problems with this show is that it's so obvious and bland. Like, you'd think this was the first time slapstick was ever used. Charlie Chaplin's turning in his grave. Also, there is way too much slapstick with Kaz in at least some of the episodes. For some of one, he bumps into something and or gets his head hurt at least once per minute for several minutes in a row. It's just like someone working on the show definitely wanted a lot of slapstick. And yes, I am aware that a number of anime have slapstick, and there's always been slapstick in Star Wars, as mentioned. They managed to fit in basically every classic gag. You know, there's a lot of people bumping into each other. Stuff will go flying through the air, including Gorg, jumping fish with sharp teeth, food or pets, depending on who you ask, who will end up attaching themselves to people who then go, ow, that hurts. Tam will hit Kaz with wrenches, which I wrenches, which I guess is supposed to be like the habit that Zeb had of punching Ezra and sometimes all of the other crew members, but it feels like it's going too far. People will easily carry something, hand it to Kaz, who can barely carry it. You know, the the thing of you know, da, da, here's the thing, and he'll pick it up and just immediately drop to the ground. There's elevator music, two characters discussing something important but being vague while Kaz repeatedly asks what they're talking about. Someone trying a lot of different options until eventually one works in the nick of time. Someone doing something we expect to fail, but it turned out they were prepared for it, so it actually succeeded. Someone will see something ridiculous and wonder if they had too much to drink and actually refuse to drink more because of it. It's not that there's no character growth for him, but what there is is too little too late. Way too much of his screen time is him being overconfident, screaming, rubber-faced, and succeeding despite things not not because he grows past them. And yeah, Scott Lawrence plays Jarek Yeager, the owner of Yeager's repairs on board the Colossus. And I do appreciate, you know, there is a some like background and depth to him. I wish there was more. And, uh, yes, Josh Brenner voices Niku Vozo, a talented Nikto technician. And, uh, yeah, you know, one, one reviewer compares him to Drax from the Guardians of the Galaxy films, which is definitely, like, you know, that... The, the unexpected success of that, you know, definitely did lead to imitators, you know. And this is thankfully nowhere near as bad as the 2016 Suicide Squad movie. And, um, yeah, this review also says, you know, the character's always talking, and, yeah, there's there's a lot of characters on... There are there, several of the major characters in this show just constantly talking, and it's very, very... just, you wish that they would stop talking. And in addition, to, you know, Niku, in addition to the Drax thing of taking things literally, like a kleptomaniac, he doesn't really have a filter. He just says what comes to his mind, often believes exactly what is told him, no matter how far out. I get the sense that he may be on the spectrum, so I'm really glad this could help normalize that. You know, it's a, it's not really a negative depiction. Like, essentially, you know, if you would sum it up shortly, basically this show through Niku is saying 
some people are like this and you know you just got to be patient you know there's nothing actually wrong with it they're not you know on more than one occasion other characters say i'm glad the way you are i'm i'm glad you are the way you are you know kind of thing and yeah you know he's and it also points out you know some some people on the spectrum are very capable you know there's certain things that are extremely good at uh, you know it's not the you know some when you see negative representation of people on the spectrum it'll say that they're dangerous or that they don't have empathy and you know this is true of some but there's many that it isn't true of let's see and yeah a lot of the time people will talk to Niku like he doesn't take things literally even though that would be quite easy which isn't exactly positive representation but it is representative representation I've been around a lot of people who would talk to people that they know are on the spectrum and they will say you know they won't be careful to to say like you know I realize that it takes a little effort but I've never found it particularly difficult and and I really appreciate he does understand complex concepts and actually even speaks unusual languages can help serve as interpreter you just have to speak to him in a way that he understands that's all and he's usually happy he loves meeting new people making new friends even like people that you know like like I said he's one of the few people who's friendly to cans from from early on and yeah he's friendly to even people that other others would consider people to avoid and this sometimes really works out he'll befriend someone that uh, yeah he gets really happy when there's food to eat uh, you know repeating the word food over and over some things do make him make him upset he's absolutely my favorite character on the, of the show Susie McGrath plays Tamra Tam Rivora, mechanic, aspiring pilot. She gets very frustrated with Kaz and really feels like he's been dumped into her lap and now she has to deal with someone who's, you know. Donald Faison plays Hype Faison, leader of the Ace Squadron who protect the Colossus. He's very full of himself, but he is also a very talented racer. Myrna Velasco plays Tora Doza, one of the Ace Squadron pilots, the daughter of Captain Doza. Because of their similar ages and interest in, as well as time of ad, flying, and the fact that they appear to Tora to come from such different parts of the class system, help make things interesting. Seemingly, neither of them have never met someone like the other. The two of them get along, sharing a platonic relationship, and the show does not make it out to be less meaningful than it were love. You know, it's definitely not a friend zone situation. She's very friendly, open, sweet, and helpful, and this is in part because of her privileged life, free of many of the difficulties that the poor are forced to endure. And, you know, her biggest problem appears to be occasional boredom, but she is also an excellent pilot, something she wasn't just given, she had to work for it, though she had help, Nepo baby style. And, it, and, and she does usually fight her boredom on her own and she has just this slight accent that I'm not certain I, I'm not familiar with the actress I don't know if that's just her natural accent but yeah just just slight I don't know if maybe Middle Eastern or Indian but yeah you know can help normalize that for for the kids watching so that's great Jason Hightower plays Captain Emmanuel Doza, the captain of the Colossus. And I don't really want to give anything away about the character. I'll just say that there was more to him than I at first thought. I and I appreciate that. Nazneen Contractor plays Sinara Sam, and I really don't want to give anything away about that character. I'll just say I quite appreciate her. I, I, yeah, she she's got some really great stuff. Liam McIntyre plays Commander Pyre, a high-ranking officer in the First Order. Sumali Montano plays Agent Tierney, an agent in the First First Order Security Bureau. 
Oscar Isaac does uh, play Poe Dameron in some episodes. Yeah, Commander in the Resistance. Bobby Moynihan and Jim Rash as Orca and Flix, respectively. The Chadrafan and Gozo, who run the Office of Acquisitions on board the Colossus. Basically, they sell, you know, parts for ships and, and stuff. And just, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. They got a lot of personality. Like, you get a sense, you know, they had a life before this thing. And that's, those are the best characters on this show. The ones who had a life and then, you know, okay, sure. The Colossus seems like a pretty stable place to be, you know. And you'll every so often get details about their past lives. Another, you know... Yeah, that's also true of Jared Yeager and Commander Doza, and Tova Felcher as Aunt Z, the Gillian proprietor of Aunt Z's Tavern. I got kind of a vibe of the the what's it called um, Casablanca from from that the way that you know. I haven't watched it, but a lot of people say that that's the vibe they got from that one tavern in the Star Wars holiday special. And let's see. Right, and the. Yeah, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn voices both Freya Fenris, one of the pilots of the Ace Squadron. I appreciate Freya, Freya Fenris. So that's, yeah, someone who came up with that definitely appreciates Norse mythology. Freya being one of the gods, Fenri, Fenrir or Fenris being the, the wolf that, just, so yeah. And and she does also, she looks like she, she comes from, from there, you know, and it's, it's nice to, to see, you know, you're, you know, I, I hate when people say, oh, so we're not allowed to, no, you're allowed to appreciate, just don't say it's better, but, you know, yeah, Norse, Norse myth, that's, that's cool, you know, if, if every single character on this show was Aryan, then, okay, you know, no, no, that's not, but the, the, you know, there are, you know, Tam and Yeager are both POC, and I would say that Doza definitely, there's something slightly ethnic there also. But yeah, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn also voices 4DM1N, which, you know, fr frequently just referred to as 4D. She's, and the command bridge droid was this Captain Doza. It's only really, if you don't see it written, it's hard to, but, but yeah, that basically spells admin, like administration. So yeah, that's, I, I approve. And Steven Stanson and Dave Filoni play Griff Halloran and Bo Keevil, the other two members of the Ace Squadron. Because Dave Filoni likes putting himself in stuff, which, fair enough, he's, he's fun in these. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, did, I forgot. Elijah Wood voices Jace Rucklin. No, I totally, now that I, yeah, 100%, I, I hear that now that I, now that I think back. I, last time I read these were before I started watching the show, but yeah, 100%. He does good. He does a good job. Like, I, does he do a lot of voice work? I've only really seen him in live action where he's, you know, good, but yeah. And Gary Anthony Williams plays Captain Craig and Gore, the Quarren captain of the Warbird Pirate Gang. And he's great. You know, when is Gary Anthony Williams not great? Let's see. David Shaughnessy plays Drell, a weak way member of the Warbirds. Lex Lang and Christine Dunford as Major Elric Monrig and Lieutenant Gallic, officers in the First Order. <coughs> Anthony Del Rio and Nikki Suhu as Kel and Ayla. Um, let's see. Yeah, Tazia Valenza plays Vanessa, and I don't want to give anything about, away about her character, but yeah, she's also. 
quite good. And let's see. Right, the other residents of the Colossus are voiced by a group of recurring voice actors. Greg Proops, who also voiced the race commentator of Fode in Episode 1 The Phantom Menace, voices race commentator Jack Sirak, as well as Garma and Elderly Arcona. Fred Tantaschiore voices the Clatoonian Gorg Seller, Bowls of Rule, and D. Bradley Baker voices both Greville and Irascible Alina, and Glenn, a Rhodian dock worker. Jukes, a Thelian who lives on the Colossus, is also voiced by Mary Elizabeth. McGlynn. And one, at least one reviewer said there's too much of BB-8, and I would have to agree. I guess the films didn't sell enough BB-8 toys. Like, it really felt like he's just there to, like, say, oh, look who we got, you know, kind of, just, yeah. And um, I don't know how much I want to give away of these. I'll just say there are there are other, <clears throat> yeah, there are other characters, including ones from the movies. Oh, that was Lucy Lawless. Yeah, I guess I can kind of hear. Very cool that she's still working, following her since Xena. And Joe Manganiello is, of course, great as you. Yeah, that's it. That's, yeah. John DiMaggio plays a character, and yeah, obviously also great as usual. Sam Witwer, great as usual, and Steve Bloom. Yeah, really, really cool to have them. Rachel McFarlane, huh. Um, yeah, cool. Right, I will just briefly say the, um, right, and there is, you know, some of the more, some of the characters, there is the, the diversity element, and it's not limited to, like, face and, and voice and names and such, you know, but also, like, background and their experiences, their personalities and such. You know, like I mentioned, there's the the show promotes empathy for refugees, which is extremely important right now. It's really something where we need to to fix the the yeah now the the, the immigration system. I I will briefly say there is sadly one character who's basically a. I, it's it's a negative stereotype of someone of a member of the LGBTQ community. I I'm not 100% certain which exactly if if it's you know if, if it's like homophobic or transphobic, but you know one of the one of the Colossus residents is made out to be like creepy in an almost sort of predatory way like the they'll be you know they'll they'll approach someone and be like you know we should we should live together kind of thing and the other characters like ah that no don't you know and this character ap appears more than once and each time will do like a creepy hello kind of thing just yeah, I really wish they they didn't have that, but yeah. So the yeah the cinematography sometimes really really good. Like it's it's usually good in like action scenes. Like there's some races, and the camera will effectively follow and and maintain the energy of the race. And you know during more Star Wars style action scenes it also captures like the breadth and scope of the the battles or well battles skirmishes the editing is pretty good I, I definitely would say that some like bits some comedic bits definitely need a trimming but the I mean, I, I don't think that there's a single episode of this that is just, like, unwatchable. Some of them get very annoying, but there's 
there's something about every episode where after I'd watch it, I was like, you know what, that was, I like that aspect at least. Now, but yeah, the, the animation, I, I really appreciated some of the kind of, like, I, I feel like certainly once they made the decision, and I don't know which came first, but they made the decision to do this slapstick, I think that the the anime style lends itself better to that because the again there was slapstick in in clone wars and in rebels as well and yeah i probably say like in in clone wars it really really stood out when when there was slapstick like clone wars the the animation style was really well suited for the big battles that there were a number of in that show and also the like personal moments when characters would just talk about like experiences and philosophy and such but whenever they did slapstick it was often like just yeah and and here it really feels like the the so i, I don't know if the decision was made to have a lot of slapstick and then they decided anime style, or if they chose anime style, and then someone was like, then we gotta have a lot of slapstick. But either way, it's definitely the, the one that f fits the best. When they do leave the Colossus, there are some very, very cool settings. I just, I wish that there would be more of, like, I could see how, yeah, honestly, maybe it's a, maybe it's a money thing. But I could totally see how with, you know, this spying thing, you know, every so often Kaz could leave the Colossus, you know, maybe more or less once per episode even, and, you know, go to a place nearby where there was some kind of First Order thing and spy on them and you could have more variety there. Because once they do get variety, there's some really, really deeply memorable places. And, yeah, when when there is action, it is usually good. Um, yeah, you have chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights, shooting, including shooting while in vehicles. And, yeah, you know, for, for some of it, the action is extremely limited. Mostly it's just people running around, running after each other on different parts of the Colossus, throwing things at each other, slipping, falling, racing their plays. Occasionally, someone will actually be trying to kill someone else, but it's rare that it goes beyond the threat. Whenever there is, you know, classic Star Wars action, it does tend to be exciting and tense. I just wish there was significantly more of it, you know, since this is a Star Wars story, you know. But, but yeah, you know, you've got sneaking around, you know, hiding from, from troopers. You've got you know, sabotage, you've got, you know, skirmishes, the, the kind that we'd see in the original trilogy and not as much since. And, yeah, there are some emotionally charged races. Some episodes are mostly about races, similar to what you'd find at the very end of a sports movie about racing. And that brings us to the music. And yeah, they they do a good job. You know, it it fits the atmosphere fine. And some of the sound design is great. Some of it is very very like I saw someone point out, uh, Tora's dog sounds almost exactly like a regular dog, and it's like they just made one sound effect and just used that like four times in in one episode and it's like what are you doing do you not know you're working on star wars and just yeah and yeah so overall there are uh, let's see yeah so yeah we have two seasons and a total of 40 episodes and 12 shorts. And the shorts are really not important. Like, you can skip the shorts entirely. Um, but I will say, 
you know, and the thing is, the shorts are after season one, so there's some spoilers in them if you watch them first, but, like, the, the shorts really show what the, the show, like, they're, they're very, they're very, very brief, and they are indeed very focused on the, the, what's it called, um, the, um, the slapstick and and such and yeah it's a quick you know the the some of them are one minute uh, let's see the longest is like almost two and a half minutes you know so it's just yeah um yeah i think l let's see the fourth one has spoilers for um, I forget about the third one, but you can definitely watch the first two without having watched the... You should probably watch at least, like, the first episode. But yeah, after that you can watch the first three shorts, and that'll kind of give you an idea of... You know, I, I almost... Almost wish that they would have just made shorts and just... Or at least th maybe maybe one season and the rest of it just the shorts, because the shorts really are where like it's the the humor works when it's in such a small dose. And yeah, of the forty episodes, they are usually twenty one minutes, and yeah, so you know it's not a huge investment of time, and. I suppose I think if you watch the first hmm the first half dozen episodes the first six episodes of the first season if by that point you still just don't care about what's gonna happen next I'm not sure I would say to, at, at least don't watch, like, the entire run. I don't think it's necessary. Now, yeah, so the the best element. You know, before I started watching, I optimistically wrote that I expected the best element would be getting more of a sense of the world of the sequel trilogy. But there's not enough of that for my liking, so I guess... You know, I yeah, there are definitely some good values being communicated. Not every value being communicated is good, but some of them are, and yeah. The, the worst aspect, you know, when the show is at its very best, it trusts its young audience to handle darkness and mature material, paints a terrifying picture of the rise of fascism in a way that rivals that of the prequel movies, However, these moments on the show are so few and far between that I really cannot recommend the show. And most, I'd say, just watch the really good episodes. And, yeah, that's the fact that there's so little of that. Just, I, I wish that... If, if there was only one season to this, you could easily fit all of the best episodes of both seasons into that one season and you'd have a, a better overall product and yeah so if you look at you know other people's reviews there's a lot of who cares about this show and yeah the thing I was most worried about was that since there's too little world building in the movies the show has way too much work to do and yeah ultimately it doesn't really live up to that. I think it's most looking forward to was espionage, and there definitely is some really excellent stuff in that, but overall, too little of it. Now, the... yeah. Whether we're talking the season opener, the season finale, or the overall season, you know, for both seasons, they're good, not amazing. They could be worse. They are, in my opinion, the worst of these first three of the more recent animated Star Wars shows. 
yeah, I mean, personally, I'm not unhappy that I didn't skip any episodes, but if I was to, you know, yeah, if you're not, like, a completist, if you don't feel like you have to watch everything Star Wars, I would probably say just try to, I'm, I'm sure there are guides online that will tell you what episodes are worth watching, and I do think that there are some. The trailers do give too much away, and I think at least one of them does make the show, does slightly undersell the show, making it seem like it's just nothing but child-friendly stuff. Now, some of the covers, poster art, do give a little too much away, but they do also give you a good idea of what the show is like. And that brings us to Rotten Tomatoes, where Let's see. there we go. And it has a ninety ninety two from critics and a fifty six from users and the yeah the 92 from critics is based on season 1 which has 72 audience score based on 13 reviews and 2500 ratings and season 2 actually does not have <clears throat> only has 4 reviews so no tomato meter and over 100 ratings that gave it that led to it having 40% and that's because it only got the average rating was 2.8 out of 5 which yeah I there's several things that you could definitely be very frustrated about in in season 2 now on IMDB it oh, there we go and right so yeah on IMDB there are 187 user reviews or 168 if you hide spoilers I read the 100 top voted ones and of the of the four links in the external reviews section of IMDB there were three that were in English and where the links worked and yeah so you know that you can really see that this was much less like we can real quick compare rebels has oh 226 reviews so that one isn't that much more maybe i think i might be thinking of the clone wars show which has 371 okay i guess i was thinking of someone at something else anyway now the let's see did I not copy that in? I guess I did not copy that in. Okay then. Then we have the the um the user ratings. So yeah, right now it has a five point three out of ten based on six thousand eight hundred votes and 18.9% gave it a 1. And I gotta say, that really feels to me like people who basically just, there was something they didn't like, and so they gave it the lowest possible rating. I don't think it deserves so, quite that low of a rating, but that is the thing. Like, some recent stuff from... MCU and Star Wars, you know, now that Disney is calling the shots, some people just give it the lowest possible rating. Now, 15.2% gave it 6, and I, that makes pretty good sense, in my opinion. 6 or 7 is the, the rating that makes the most sense. 12.9% gave it 7, 12.6% gave it 5, 10.1 gave it 10, and, you know, there's some percentage of that that's just people trying to 
counter the ones. So, to, you know, I'm not saying, I'm sure there are people out there who think that it deserves a perfect 10. And that's great. I'm glad they enjoyed it so much. And, you know, it, it also, like, today when it's on Disney+, Plus, like, you know, if you only want to watch, like, five episodes, that's not going to cost you, you're not going to have to buy an entire season to that, for that, you know. So, the fact that it's hit or miss is not as big a problem as, you know, back when you only, were, were only able to. And, and may, that might be something they were counting on. You know, they knew that it was going to be, you know, a chunk of the audience that would come back if it was just child-friendly enough. And, you know, Star Wars is such a big property. Yeah. A bunch of people are going to watch it no matter how bad it gets, and that's part of why it gets so many one votes. 8.2% gave it 4. 7.3 gave it 8. 6.0 gave it 3. 5.5 gave it 2. 3.2 gave it 9. And... Let's see it. <clears throat> the show won a Saturn Best Animated Series on Television in 2019. And they were nominated, uh, let's see, a Primetime Emmy in 2020 for Outstanding Children's Program. Primetime Emmys 2019, also Outstanding Children's Program. And Motion Picture Sound Editors in 2020. The Golden Reel Award, Outstanding Achievement in Sound Editing, Effects, Foley, Music, Dialogue, and ADR for Short Form Animation for a specific episode. Yeah, that one uh, was was good. And, oh, right, it was also nominated for an OFTA for Best Children's Program in 2020. And that brings us to the rating so I keep going back and forth between a six and a seven and I guess ultimately ultimately it is a seven so yeah I rate this seven attempts at increasing excitement for the sequel trilogy out of ten <coughs> I don't know if I'm going to be watching this again. It, I guess it's possible that... I mean, I do... A, a parent, I don't... I guess I shouldn't give away what, because it's not difficult to find out what, but there is at least one character in this show that will apparently appear in something upcoming Star Wars live-action on Disney+. Plus. So maybe I'll rewatch their episodes for that but other than that you know unlike Clone Wars and Rebels I'm not sure I'm gonna be rewatching this one and I don't think this is one of those cases where just you know down the line in the future people will like it much better I I think that guy that one reviewer really nailed it with this is basically a toy you know if this like you could you could compare this to like the nineteen eighty seven Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or the old Biker Mice from Mars, which you know yeah when I was a kid I loved watching those. But if I sat down and watched, like I'd be happy. There are a couple of episodes of nineteen eighty seven TMNT that I do still say, you know that pretty well hold that holds up pretty well. You can watch that today and still get really into it. But a lot of them, it's just like, okay, you know, I I guess I didn't realize that stuff about it when I was a kid. But, yeah, this 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 feels too similar to, to those. You know, I, I saw, I, I have to admit, I have not myself watched the animated Avatar. Uh, I don't really have any issue with doing so. Um, I mean, I guess... I don't think it's on Disney Plus. I guess I'll do a quick check. Not currently. I mean, if it if it goes to there, I'll 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 consider it. Huh? There's a new documentary about ten minute documentary about the second Avatar capturing Pandora. Cool. 
anyway, um, yeah, I, I, um, yes, I've seen some people compare favorably the Clone Wars to the animated Avatar, and yeah, you know, I hear that the animated Avatar is amazing, and and for this to then be compa compare comparable more to like an '80s or '90s. Saturday morning cartoon toy advertisement, not great. You know, step in the wrong direction. But yeah, that is it for the review. So let me know in the comments section what is your favorite of these three. Uh, you know, yeah, Clone Wars, Rebels, or this. And what's your, yeah, what's your favorite episode of these? And. Do you think that this show wasted its potential, or did it, you know, I'd 100% I be open to debating, you know, if you think that I'm selling it short, you know, let me know. Now, the, yeah, t tomorrow I will be doing videos, separate videos talking about in, you know, yeah, in great detail, spoilery stuff about the most recent episodes of Secret Invasion. The most recent episode of True Lies that's available to me. The clearing and the most recent episode I've personally gotten around to watching of Screen Queens. So, hope to catch you then. I will also be doing a movie later in the week. Oh, right. Screen Queens is Thursday, but the others are tomorrow, Wednesday. And it's looking like the movie will be Friday this week. So, yeah, hope to catch you at one of those. And I, yes, I will be continuing my journey through the animated Star Wars shows since they are all on Disney Plus. And, yeah, you know, so, so, yeah, um, The Bad Batch, I do hear really great things about so looking forward to watching that one and yeah I'm actually almost caught up there aren't very many left that I haven't done yet so yeah may the force be with you